Hey folks, Dan with Holy Spirit Soapbox once again. I hope you're doing awesome and I hope you're having such a wonderful day or evening or night right now. Whenever you're listening, wherever you are in the world, we pray for you always and we're so appreciative of you listening to Holy Spirit Soapbox and spreading the gospel first and foremost and then Holy Spirit Soapbox. So please continue to do that both if you can for us. Now, I wanted to get into this because this is called You Aren't Welcome Here. I mentioned in a previous episode that our family, my immediate family, my wife and kids, have moved to a brand new state. And so far, so good. It's actually really, really awesome. People have been really welcoming and really nice to us. So we're we're starting to feel right at home. And we have this opportunity, if you will, to call this a beginning of a new life or to begin a new life okay and that seems to be the common quote when somebody moves to a brand new place you get to start fresh or start over when we give or gave our lives up to christ and continue to strengthen our relationship with him our previous lives and previous selves diminish okay we decrease so he can increase so we can create new lives in christ and let his cup overflow in us and through us. Now in Ephesians chapter 4 verses 22 to 24, now this is in the NIV if you want to read along, it's again Ephesians chapter 4 verses 22 to 24, Paul says this. He says, "You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new." in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. We're no longer that old self, is what he's saying. The self that only cares about selfish desires, but now we are are newly in Christ, newly created in Christ and long for God's will to be done. That old self is gone. And this is really, really important. When we moved to Denver from our original hometowns in Massachusetts, we saw that as an opportunity to start over and start fresh as well. Now, we had just given up our lives to Christ, and he was working in us. We were allowing him to work in us a little bit to rid us of our old selves, to take on this new identity. Now, identity is huge. Identity is huge, and we are going to do a multi-part series on identity in in the near future, so please look out for that because that will be a life changer, I promise you. So identity is huge. Always keep that in mind. But as he was working in us to rid us of our old selves to take on that new identity, we were still doing and saying a lot of the same things that our old selves didn't say. You know, he started to change us slightly in some ways, but of course, it's not always a light switch moment where you just change 100% overnight. The continuous work that's being done in us to sanctify us and prepare us for heaven works as we let it. If we continue to want to be our old selves and cling to our old selves, then we're essentially blocking the spirit from working in us to change us from the inside out because that's how it works with God. That's how it works. We're changed on the inside first because how we are on the inside reflects how we are on the outside. If we cling to selfishness, selfishness reflects outwardly. Now I say all this because as God continued to work in us and we started to change to better reflect Christ and not our old drinking, party, and cursing, lying ways, and then we would visit old friends and family, they would kind of question us like, who are you? <laughs> are you the same person? And I'm, we're like, no, we're not. And thank you for noticing, right? Our answer is, was and still is no. We are now in Christ as our identity where we want to, to better reflect who he is. Does this still upset some people who want the old Dan and Stacy back? Yeah, we're sure it does. But, but we have now focused on wanting to show everyone Christ's love. We're trying our best to not put ourselves on pedestals, okay? It, that, this is the hard part. We don't want to say we're up here and they're down there, right? That's, that's not what we're saying. We're not saying we're better than you because we are Christ followers. No, but we're trying not to get caught back up in the place we were before Christ. That's, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to, to be new creation in Christ, or as I like to call it, 
our BC days, <laughs> okay? Like before Christ, BC, right? That's what I call it. I, I It's funny because like people, you know, I talk to Christians and like we talk about stories, we talk about testimonies and I'm like, yeah, those are my BC, BC days. That was before Christ for me. That was my before Christ moment where I drank like this or I did these crazy things and that was BC. Now, after Christ, we're different, right? We're totally different, but we try to be humble and we try to serve others more than ourselves. And that's the goal. That's the goal because that's what Jesus does and did. And maybe you've gone through or are currently going through something similar, right? This kind of situation where you've lost friends or family since finding Christ. Has that happened to you? And we're hoping that's not the case, but it does happen. It really does. And we can only pray That others start finding and seeking Christ first so that they can be a witness as well. And then they can witness the incredible joy it brings that we are going through as well. And we shouldn't push, like, push people into finding Christ. That's not how this works. That's what the Pharisees did. That's what the Sadducees did. Not about Christ, but they pushed you into tradition. They, They pushed you into following God. And if you didn't, you're wrong, you're you're a horrible person. What what Christ did and what the apostles did and what we should do is we should live like God. We should live like Christ so that they can really see what he is like. Back to the quick story though. Because we basically acted the same way in Denver as we did in Massachusetts. So those people started getting used to that same Dan and Stacy too. And when we decided to continue to dig deeper into our relationship with Christ, they also started walking away from us or started to question things we were trying to walk away from and create distance from that caused us to sin. And ultimately, these family members and these friends that don't believe in and follow Christ remember us as ones that are not really followers of Christ. Like, we used to say it. We used to say we're Christian. We used to say we're Christ followers. We used to go to church and act pious and act self-righteous. But they don't remember our actions reflecting that. And that's how they remember us. They remember our BC days, our before Christ days. And, And they may want us to stay or be in those BC days still. And listen, they're not the problem, by the way. They are not the problem. And we're no greater than another believer or non-believer in Christ. But as we continue again to deepen our relationship and intimacy with God, our Creator, our Father, our Christ, our Savior, and it leads to distancing ourselves between you and certain people, or maybe not even you doing the distancing, it just happens organically where there's a distance that starts to, this this wedge in a way that starts to be between you and certain people, just know that heaven is more worth it. And we should continue to love them though and serve them. Like keep trying to hang out with them, right? If they, if they want to hang out with you, great. But if they don't and they're the ones making the distance, oh well. Right? We have to follow Christ. We have to follow Jesus. But we have to keep loving them and serving them as Jesus loved and served people that didn't follow him. There were so many people that didn't love Jesus at the time. They couldn't stand him. But he still served them. Judas, we all know what Judas did. Iscariot, right? What did he do? He took money instead of Christ. Okay? He totally totally betrayed Jesus and Jesus washed his feet. Now in Luke 4, there's this interesting situation that happens between Jesus and the people of his hometown of Nazareth. Now, this is really shortly after he started his ministry. He reads scripture from Isaiah explaining how the Messiah is to come. Then he explains that that time is now that he essentially is a Messiah. What happens after that is the interesting part. Let's check it out. I'm in Luke 4, once again, verses 22 to 30, and it says this, All spoke well of him. They spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that came from his lips. They're talking about Jesus. Isn't this the son of Joseph, they asked? Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Do here in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. 
Then he added, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. But I tell you truthfully that there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the sky was shut for three and a half years, and great famine swept over all the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to the widow of Zarephath in Sidon. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet. Yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. On hearing this, all the people in the synagogue were enraged. (laughs) They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him over the cliff. But Jesus passed through the crowd and went on his way. This is loaded. Man, this, there's so much stuff here. Okay. The people there felt the grace and authority in Jesus' teaching. They were surprised that he could preach so well as a Nazarene. Nazareth was a small little town primarily full of low-income families and lesser-known people. Nobody came from Nazareth. Nobody came from there. They were all these people that were kind of left behind. And they actually believed Jesus. They, they heard about the miracles performed and wanted this to happen to them. Essentially, they wanted the miracles more than the Savior. Let me repeat that. They wanted the miracles more than the Savior. Ain't that like a lot of people nowadays? Honestly, I want to see the miracles, but I'm not going to follow Christ. I'm not going to follow God. I just want miracles to happen in my life. So when he mentioned that the issue is not that more miracles should happen, especially in Nazareth, but hearts need to be changed to start actually following him, Jesus Christ, they get mad and run Jesus out of town. Now, as you can see, people still use their free will to reject Jesus himself. They, or we, continue to do that to this day. Now, linking all of this back to the story I've told about moving to different towns and then returning... When people see that we've changed to better our relationship with God and they don't want to do the same, they may reject us. They may run us out of town. Even though Jesus is good for every single human being that has ever lived and that will ever live, Jesus is great for them. They don't want it. Get out of town. I don't want to hear it. Now, what we all have struggled with, even ourselves prior to giving our lives up to Christ, is knowing that we need a savior. Now, if people in our hometowns remember us as our old selves and even seeing that finding Christ has done wonders for our lives now, they may still not want to find Christ and change their hearts to follow Christ. Now, what I'm trying to say too is I'm not like Jesus and Stacy was not like Jesus. We were sinning before we moved. We were really, really bad sinners. Okay, we did a lot of bad things. But we decided to change. So tying all that back in, people may not want to change. They see, wow, Dan and Stacy, you have so much joy now. And, and it's just this, there's something about you folks. And I, ho- I mean, I'm, I'm just saying I'm hoping they're saying this stuff. But let's pretend they are. Let's say, wow, you know, what is it? And I, as soon as I mention Jesus, they're like, oh, oh, I'm glad that worked for you guys. What? <laughs> it works for you too. You know, what we what we need to still do, though, as I mentioned earlier, is continue to live like Jesus, regardless of what they're saying. Immediately after this whole fiasco with Jesus, he healed people of their demons not too far from the synagogue. He was not too far, and he took demons out of people right there. He still took the time to serve those in the region, regardless if they accepted him or not. So what are we to do, my friends? We continue to live as Christ followers. We fall deeper in love with Jesus every single day of our lives. We pray to God. We pray that we can continuously live and and be worked on internally so that all of this junk, right, the stuff that we are just struggling with goes away and then we can start living just as Christ did, because you can do no wrong if you live as Christ did. Some people may think opposite. Some people may be like, wow, how come you're not drinking anymore? How come you don't do this anymore? How come you don't watch these type of shows or watch pornography? Or why don't you do these? And why don't we talk about these other women that just walk by us, even though you have a wife or a husband? Why? Well, here's why, right? I want to follow Christ. 
Christ tells me. He he revealed in me that these things are no good for me. I don't need this anymore. So I don't want it anymore. I don't want it anymore. It has led me to more joy and hope and peace and love. I love this life. I love this life. So if we do that, hopefully people will see it. Regardless if, you're, if, if they're in your hometown, if they're people that you've known your entire lives and they've known you a different way before, it doesn't matter. Love God and then love people. That's it. So we're going to skip the verses to meditate on because Luke 4 is pretty heavy. All right. Luke was a physician, so he wrote very descriptively. He was very good at what he wrote, and he made sure to get as many details as possible. So I encourage you to read Luke 4 and meditate on that chapter. But I do have some questions for you either way. Three questions. The first question is kind of a two-part question, but we'll, we'll get there. Ready? So question number one. If you've given your life to Christ, do you often feel rejected by those that you felt once loved you, such as maybe family or friends? 1B is if you have not given your life to Christ yet, is being rejected by family or friends a reason you are reluctant to give your life to Christ? Question two. How might feeling or being rejected by family or friends affect your relationship with God, if at all? And then finally, question three. How has this Bible passage of Jesus being rejected in his own hometown while spreading actual good news of salvation changed your perspective on continuing to live as Christ did in your hometown and everywhere else? I want to thank you one more time. As always, thank you, thank you, thank you for continuing to support us. We love you so much and we pray that you can continue to, to reach out to us. We're getting prayer requests from all over the world and it's absolutely amazing. We want to pray with you and we may be adding something to the website soon that we hope will help everybody. But for now, I want to pray over you so if you can take a prayer posture, whatever it looks like, if it's safe to do so, let's do that and let's talk to God. Our Father, we have to admit that feeling rejected by, by friends and family have this really negative effect on our mindset. We want to live like Christ, but we also want those around us to witness who you are and to feel what we feel by following you. And we pray that we can continue to keep our eyes towards heaven during these tough, horrible situations with people around us and, and, and ask that you continue to guard our hearts with your word. And we pray that we do not fall the temptation of doubt and fear sprouting from rejection of people and ask that you continue to work in us and through us. And we pray all of this in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen.